Amen, 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 amen. You guys, uh, if you can take your seats, um, well, it's good to be back. Good to be in the house of the Lord. Um, my name is James. I'm one of the pastors here. Welcome. Um, welcome to Freedom Life Church. I'm, I'm glad you're joining us. Uh, I, I just want to kind of dive straight in, if, if you're okay with that. Um, just kind of check the pulse of the room and check the pulse of the house and uh, check things online. H- how many of you would say, uh, by show of hands, how many of you would say that you're in a stretch season right now? <laughs> That's a church. You're in a, a stretching season life. There's some things that are okay. There's some things that are going well. There's some things that are good. But at, at some level, there's some things in your life that just seem like they're falling apart in a stretch season. Like, I, I, don't, I don't know what it is. I can't quite put my finger on it. But it's like, gosh, I'm just being stretched. I, I, and, you know, think about it. Pain is relative, and, and the stretching is relative. So what stretches you may not stretch me. What stretches them may not stretch you. But regardless, it's a stretch, and you feel it. It's a stretch. I, I've been, um, like they were saying earlier, I'm the president of our Freedom School of Ministry over, and I, it's something that we've been working on for the last year and some change. And I've had the opportunity to build and lead this Freedom School of Ministry. It's going great. Sign up. You can see some folks in the back. But the reality is it's been a stretch. It's been tough. I've been having to do some things that I've never done before. It's been a stretch. Uh, this, this October, I am finishing my master's. Praise God. <laughs> But those of you who have been around me know that it's been a stretch. It's a stretch. I've been loving on my family and doing my best to love on my family during this time, being faithful to my wife and being faithful to my daughters, and it's been a stretch. We were on vacation uh, a couple of weeks ago. This was our first vacation after, uh, you know, being in, uh, uh, like not being able to go anywhere for over a year. Many of you know what I'm talking about. And we were finally able to get together as a family, the five of us, and go somewhere quiet. And then midway through the vacation, we got a call from Philadelphia that one of our family members tragically passed away. It was unexpected. It's a stretch. And so we, we go and we're rearranging things. I make sure that my wife is able to get to Philadelphia to be with our family. And the church, our church family here stepped in big time. It was such a blessing to me because for that week while my wife was up in Philly handling business with our family, I'm here in, in Virginia trying to take care of my three girls, do my master's work, and continue to build the Freedom School of Ministry. It, it was a stretch. I was a single dad for a minute and I'm like, I don't like this. This is, this is a stretch. But I'm grateful for our family here at the church that gave us meals and prayers and texts. I'm grateful for all of you. It was a stretch. And what's crazy is that we were driving to Philadelphia and to, to go and to, to the funeral and to be with our family. We're driving to Philadelphia. In this car, I've got three girls under the age of nine. Uh-huh. And then in the front seat, I had three women 60 and over. And I'm thinking to myself, this is going to be a stretch. <laughs> I mean, at some level, I run out of words to say. At, at some level, I don't know what I'm going to do. And so I had my headphones ready. I had my podcast all set up. I had my Audible books loaded. I was just ready to put my headphones in and just drive and continue that stretch. But something happened in this car ride that I'll never forget. I was sitting with these women who were 60 and over, and all of them just wise. All of them had gone through some significant issues in their life. They they all were represented there. It was so powerful for me. This is one of the best car rides I had ever experienced in my life because all of these women had come to the same conclusion about life. Each one of them had been through a divorce. Each one of them had dealt with some form of abuse. Each one of them had to deal with the loss of loved one. Each one of them had had lived in poverty at some point in their life. Each one of them had to deal with some of the hardest things that life could throw at them. And they begin to tell me, I begin to ask, hey, how did y'all get through the stretch? And I'm just giving you some advice that if you get around wise people, listen. Just listen to them. Somebody got a little more gray hair than you, you might want to listen. Somebody that just going a little bit further than you, you might want to sit down, shut up, and listen. So I'm listening, and here's the advice that they gave me, and then I'll jump into the message, but I hope this encourages you. Here's what they said. Uh, on, On all of them, they were kind of working through their own stories, but each of them said this. They said, you keep moving forward. 
It's what they said. Listen, I'll never forget this word because each of them had dealt with all of these different things that life could throw at them. And here's what they said. I'll never forget this. He says, I had to keep moving forward because I was afraid that if I stopped, I would never get back up. Those who hope in the Lord, those who keep moving, those who keep moving forward. And then they said something else. And I, and I, I know the stories are real. This wasn't made up because in the car was my mom. I know that story. I lived that. I watched her when she was divorcing my dad. I watched when my dad went to prison because he abused my sister. I, I watched my mom walk through this. She kept moving forward. My aunt was in the room and she, was, uh, she experienced poverty and all the other things. Miss Sandra was also there. And I know their stories. They kept moving forward. But the other piece that they said to me that I'll never forget, it says that for some reason, no matter what I was going through, for some reason, no matter how things were working out, for some reason, God kept using me and he kept strengthening me. For some reason, God kept using me and he kept strengthening me. When, when, when my spouse died, God kept using me and he kept strengthening me. When, when my kids were going crazy, they said, God kept using me and he kept strengthening me. And what I learned from that is that God is still moving. It doesn't matter what's going on in your life. God is still moving. He's unchanging, but he still moves. And here's what I got from this. And I want you to get this. And we're not in the messages. I'm just trying to set it up. Here's what I want you to understand. I learned from these women. The stretch is an indicator that God is still working in your life. The stretch that you're in is an indicator that God is still working in your life. Listen, why would he stretch something that he can't use? Why would he stretch something that no longer has value? Why would the creator decide to bend and and push and stretch something that no longer has value for him? Why would he stretch something that's not valuable? The stretch is an indicator that God is still working in your life. The stretch is an indicator that there's more, family. There is more to you. There is more to you. There is more to you. The stretch is an indicator that there is hope. I had no idea that I would be sitting in this car in the stretch with these women, and I would get so much hope. So much hope, I had no idea that I would find hope in a hidden place. And I want to submit that to you this, this, this weekend, that hope in a hidden place. If I could title our message together, it would be hope in a hidden place. You, you may be in a spot right now where you're feeling stretched. But listen, I don't want you to tune out if you're not being stretched because if you're not being stretched right now, it means that you just left the stretching season or you're about to go into a stretching season. So you might need to just sit still and listen or share what you've learned in your stretch with others. But whatever it is, there's hope in a hidden place. And so we've been diving into this series uh, called Reels. We've been talking about the parables of Jesus and how he brings us closer to see what closer what the kingdom of God looks like. And so he gives us these stories that gives us significant truth. And so we want to unpack some of those today. And here's where I want to go today. If you've got your Bible, Matthew 13, 44, Matthew 13, 44, and it'll be up here on the screen as well. Here it is, very short. It's a sentence long or two sentences. It says the kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field. When a man found it, he hid it again. I'm so glad God hid me. (laughs) I'm so glad that God hid me. I'm so glad that he kept me from things that I wanted to do, but he wouldn't allow me to do. I'm so glad that his grace actually kept me. I'll, I'll leave that there. He hid it again, and then in his joy went and sold all he had and bought that field. Here's a parable. The kingdom of heaven is like a treasure in a field. When a man found it, he hid it again. And then in his joy, he went and sold all he had and bought that field. Let me give you some of the background of this parable. Jesus is speaking to these parables. He's speaking to these large crowds of people. He's on the Sea of Galilee. The text says a few chapters earlier, a few verses earlier. He's in on the Sea of Galilee. He's left one of the disciples' house to join into one of the disciples' boats. And he's speaking to a crowd, almost in a cove. And there's a large crowd, it's almost as if he's in a theater. And he's talking to the crowd and he's sharing with them the the mysteries of the kingdom. And he begins with the the sower in the field and he goes into the the mustard seed and the yeast and all of those other parables. And he explains some of them, but now he's shifted gears. 
Now he shifts because it says that Jesus, a little bit earlier, it says that Jesus goes from the Sea of Galilee talking to crowds to now getting into their house. Just read it for yourself. He says he goes into the house. So that means that when he shared this parable, he was a little intense. That, that means that it probably wasn't as comfortable as the other ones. That means that Jesus was probably staring at eyeballs. He was probably looking right across from people. That means that they were in the house. And you've got to understand, this means it was intimate, it was intense, but you've got to understand that it was no longer the crowd. Now it was the disciples. The disciples. These are the folks who had given up everything to follow Jesus. These are the folks who had left their businesses to follow Jesus. These are the folks who had left lucrative careers to follow Jesus. These are the folks who had given up relationships, uh, had given up habits. They had given up family systems because they, they, they were ostracized by their families to follow Jesus. Are you feeling some of the tension here that, that they are actually left everything behind to follow Jesus? He's talking to a new crowd here. He's talking to you. It's getting personal now. And so what happens is Jesus is using language in this parable that sometimes is lost on us, but it was super familiar to them. Super familiar. As, you, as you're learning about this text, here's what it says. The hidden treasure. That's something we're like, what's a hidden treasure? How could you do it? They didn't have all of those questions because the hidden treasure was so common to them. Here's why. Because they didn't have banks. They didn't have banks. They didn't have ATM cards. They didn't have debit cards, credit cards. They didn't have Cash App. They didn't have PayPal. They didn't have Venmo. They didn't have Amazon Prime. They had none of that stuff. All they had was to bury stuff. If there was something that was valuable to you, what you'd have to do is you'd have to bury it in the ground so that nobody else could do it. If you were trying to protect your family legacy, they would bury those things in the ground. If, if someone was trying to get you, because remember, the Roman government is here. If they're trying to get your stuff and trying to take away all of your life savings, you would bury that in the ground. And so hidden treasure represented protection for them. But it also represented provision. You've got to understand that these folks, it was common for people to uh, get rich off of hidden treasure. Because you were just walking in the field one day, you happened to stumble, and it's like, oh, man. And all your friends like, man, how'd Johnny get on to come up like that? Because he stumbled on hidden treasure. They were used to that. They were used to say, oh, oh, there's Mark, man. He started from the bottom, now he's here. They were used to that. They were used to seeing people get rich off of this hidden treasure. It also represented provision. And so Jesus uses common language. I'm just trying to give you some, some background. He uses common language and imagery that they would have understood to connect with them in a very personal way. He uses the field because this is something that they understood. They were agricultural. They were, they were in agriculture, so the field was their office. It's not strange for Jesus to use language that we understand because he's personal. And so here it is. This is what I want to bring you into, though. You've got all these things set up. Jesus left the Sea of Galilee, or he's on the Sea of Galilee, and now he goes into a house. The house of one of the disciples who had left everything to follow him. <laughs> For a minute, I want you to imagine yourself as this disciple. You, you set up the house. I mean, you got this house ready so that all these people could be at your house and party. You brought out the best food you could find. You got the best store-bought fried chicken you could find. You brought it in there. You, you, you let people sit on your sofas and even took the plastic off. Like, you, 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 had, you had the best, you know, chinaware uh, that you would keep in that cabinet in the corner of your house. You took out the best stuff so they could eat there because Jesus was in the room. Like, Jesus was at the party. You're ready to have a party because you're one of the disciples, and Jesus is about to tell y'all something that's going to change your life. And Jesus starts off the same parable saying, the kingdom of heaven is like. Wait, what? Because we got to understand what Jesus is getting at when he says the kingdom of heaven is like. What he's getting at is that what you thought it was, it's not that. Hold on, Jesus. I've given up everything. I've given up everything, and you're telling me that it's not what I thought? Jesus, I was hoping that you were going to overthrow the Roman government. That's why I followed you. I was hoping, Jesus, that you would bring us peace, that you would be the king and sit on the throne so that we would have peace. Jesus, I was hoping that you would make my life easier. Jesus, I was hoping that you would, you would allow me to, to get through this a little bit easier. I thought that you would come through. I want you to feel the text. 
See, see, Jesus, I I thought you were going to do something, and now you're talking about the kingdom of heaven is like? And you're talking about some some treasure in a field? And then you're talking about somebody giving it all away to get the treasure in the field? Hold up, Jesus. What else is there? What else could I give? Some of you are sitting on the edge of your seat wondering, Lord, what else could I give? What else is there? I was hoping. I I was hoping, Jesus. Anybody ever had hope deferred? Anybody ever been walking through a season of discouragement? Anybody walking through a season of disappointment? You've been putting your faith and your trust in God, and you're walking through a season of disappointment. Anybody in a stretch? You're just in a stretch right now. You've been disappointed because you're in a stretch. You won't say it, so let me step into your house, disciple. Jesus I stopped fooling around with them. I was hoping by now you'd give me my husband. Right? Jesus, I don't don't look at those websites anymore, and so I was hoping by now you would give me and my wife some more intimacy. Jesus, I've been to this altar numerous times, and I was hoping by now that you would take away this anger that I'm feeling. I was hoping by now that you would take away some of the desires that I'm feeling towards that person. I was hoping by now you would take some of this stuff away. Jesus, we've been praying. Jesus, we've been fasting. And I saw you heal a portion of my mom, but I was hoping that you would heal all of her. I, I, was, I was hoping, Jesus, when I decided to live for you, I was hoping that that would mean that I would benefit financially. I was hoping, Jesus, that I wouldn't have to go through this divorce. When I trusted in you, Jesus, I was hoping that we would actually be able to have children. When I trusted in you, Jesus, I was hoping that you wouldn't allow my child to die. I was hoping that I wouldn't lose my job. I was hoping that he wouldn't walk out on me. I was hoping that they wouldn't lose their father. I was hoping, I was hoping, I was hoping. I was hoping, Jesus. I mean, I want you to understand this. The disciples knew all the right stuff, just like we do. But they're in the tension now of how to use it. It's frustrating to know something and not be able to use it. Now it's in your house. Here's what I want you to understand. It's easy to believe when you're in the crowd, (laughs) but it's hard when you're at home in the stretch. It's easy to believe when you're at church, oh yeah, praise the Lord, more and more and more. When you're at home and your kids are acting a fool, it's a stretch. It's easy to believe when we're all together, but now when you're on your job and they're asking you to do something that will question your integrity, you're in the stretch. It's easy to say, hey, I'm in my small group, man, I love y'all, I love everybody. But then when you go home and you and your husband are sleeping on opposite sides of the bed, it's the stretch. The stretch on your college campus is a stretch. See, it's, when you're at home, your belief is being stretched. You're at home, your identity is stretched. Your hope is stretched. You're being stretched. The idea is stretch is draining, and it gets you wondering and questioning. Is this really what I should be doing? You guys got to understand the context that these folks were in. Just a chapter or so before, they were looking at their friend named John, who many of them had followed. They followed John, and then they left John to follow Jesus. Come to find out, the guy that they followed named John is actually in jail because he was following Jesus. Hold up, Jesus. On top of that, they're walking through this this journey with Jesus, and they find out that these Pharisees are calling Jesus Beelzebub. They're calling Jesus the devil. You mean I'm following the devil? It's a stretch. It starts getting you questioning and wondering, is this really what I should be doing? Did you really choose me, Lord? Are you sure I'm supposed to be here? Things would be so much easier if... Things would be so much better if, listen, my life would be so much easier. Their life would be so much easier if I could just quit. If it would just be, if I could just give up on it all, it would be so much easier. But I tell my daughters this, and I want to share this with you as well. Listen, don't go grocery shopping on an empty stomach. Don't do it. Because (laughs) everything looks good. And you will make the worst decisions you'll ever make in your life. 
Family, I want you to understand, don't make big decisions when your soul is empty. Don't make big decisions when your heart is heavy. Don't make big decisions about relationships when your heart is heavy. Don't make decisions about your future when your past is calling out on you and telling you how dirty you are, how filthy you are, how empty you are. Don't make big decisions on an empty stomach. Jesus is understanding what they're going through. He's sitting in the tension in this house, and what he's trying to get them to understand is he's stretching them right now. He's stretching them. And when you're in the stretch, you don't need complication. You don't need a whole lot of points. You don't need a whole lot of stuff. When you're in the stretch, you need hope. I need something to fill me. I need something to benefit. I need something to fill my empty soul. And Jesus is stretching them right now. And it seems like he's pushing them to something that will give them hope. It seems like Jesus is trying to get them to dig. If you guys have been checking out this whole message, if you're watching online and you've been checking out this whole message, here's the part you want to listen to. This is the hope. Here's the point. Here's the main point. When you're looking for hope in a hidden place, this is what Jesus is telling us, when you're looking for hope in a hidden place, focus on the treasure. When you are looking for hope in the midst of your pain, focus on the treasure. When when you're looking for hope in the the midst of this disappointment, when you're looking for hope in the midst of this discouragement, and when you're looking for hope and you're trying to parent your children and you're trying to parent your parents, when you're looking for hope, focus on the treasure. When you're in the stretch, focus on the treasure. And so let's unpack this for a second for the next couple of minutes. What is the treasure? What is is the treasure. What is worth so much that this man would be willing to sell everything to gain it? What is worth so much that Jesus is inviting them in to a stretch? What is worth so much? Well, there's two applications of it, and I don't want to pretend like I'm a a smart guy or anything like that. These are folks, men and women, who have been studying these things for years, and scholars have a few interpretations and applications for this text. I believe, though, that you've got to put them together. Some of them say it's an either-or, but I believe it's both and. It's kind of like one of those situations where this this is like peanut butter and jelly. It's kind of like, you know, um, like salt and pepper. It's kind of like, you know, uh, fried chicken, mac and cheese, and greens. Like, you've got to have them together to experience fullness, right? So here it is. Here's the one part that I want you to get. This is significant on its own, but I want you to get this. The first one is the kingdom of heaven. The first application of this is the kingdom of heaven. Here it is. The kingdom of heaven is the rule and the reign of Jesus. When Jesus is allowed to rule and reign, that's where the kingdom of heaven is. And what this means is that the hope of the kingdom is that wherever Jesus is, we see provision, we see protection, and we see power. Look at the scripture, look at your life. This is what we see whenever Jesus steps in the building. Provision. It says, let me unpack it. Provision. The kingdom has unlimited resources. Family, if you came here with a need, the kingdom can fill that need. Jesus has the capacity to meet your needs. In other words, if you're looking for hope, he can do that. If you're looking for healing, he can do that. If you're looking for comfort, it's available. If you're looking for peace, it's available. If you're looking for renewal, it's available. If you're struggling with anxiety, he can relieve some of that tension. It's available. If you are walking through depression, he can give you wisdom to find the right counselor. It's available. It's available. But also protection. Protection is the kingdom has the capacity to get me out of harm's way. Jesus, in other words, Jesus paid for the penalty of sin. So now my past no longer has a bearing on my future. I ain't worried about the penalty. I ain't worried about my past no more. But Jesus also put on the presence of sin so that I could be forgiven and put on the presence of his righteousness. That means that right now in my presence, I don't have to struggle with the things I used to struggle with anymore. Like I actually have his righteousness. But he also took on the power of sin. He defeated the power of sin. That means I've got a hope and a future. In other words, that means I'm eternally protected. I just want you to understand this. I'm eternally protected. But here's the other piece that it says. It's also power. The kingdom of heaven is also representing representing the power. The kingdom has the capacity to change my life. 
The kingdom had the capacity to change my life. You guys didn't come to hear me preach. You came to experience the kingdom. The kingdom is what changes your life. The kingdom of heaven is what changes our lives. In other words, when you say yes to Jesus, he gives you his power. Here's a trail. John John 14, 12, he says, if you believe in me, you will do what I do and even greater things. That's what he says. Matthew 28, 18, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given unto me. Therefore, go. In other words, whatever power Jesus has through the Holy Spirit, I also have. This is what you came to church for. Whatever power Jesus has through the Holy Spirit, I have it. Listen, just type in the chat. Just say to somebody, I have that too. I have that too. If Jesus could speak to the wind and the waves of his life and calm the storms and say, peace be still, then I also have that power. I have that power too. I can speak to the wind and the waves of my situations and say, no, 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 I'm not going out like that. I have that power too. If Jesus could withstand temptation while he was hungry, while he was on an empty stomach, when he could bend, he can say, hold on, no, man does not live by bread alone, but on the word of God, then I have that power too. I can stand in the midst of temptation and have integrity. If, if Jesus could bring together broken people, broken people and mend their relationships and bring them to a healing place, then I can sit in the USA and be a force for reconciliation because I have that power too. If Jesus could love the unlovable, I can look at my neighbor and I can love them. I have that power too. If Jesus could reach out to Peter, James, and John when he was in one of the hardest seasons in his life and he asked them for community, then I have that power too. We don't have to be alone, family. If Jesus could grieve and have sorrow, I want you to get this. If he could grieve and have sorrow, then I have that power too. You ain't got to read a self-help book to know that. This is in the Bible. I have that power too. It's one of those healthy things that God has given us that we need to grieve things, to resolve things. Not just fake it till you make it. Resolve the stuff. I have that power too. But if Jesus could also endure the cross... If he could endure the whipping, stones, the slander, the spitting, if he can endure the cross, I have that power too. I have the power to endure the cross in my life. I don't know what your cross is, but I know what my cross is. I don't know what's stretching you, but I know what's stretching me. And Jesus is saying that you have that power too. The treasure of the kingdom is that we are not hopeless. We are not powerless. We are not helpless, but we have the king. There's always more, family. We don't have to be victims anymore. This is the treasure of the kingdom. This is the hope. This is what we put our hope in, our faith in. This is the treasure of the kingdom. You didn't hear, you didn't come here to hear some bald head black guy preach. This is the hope of the kingdom. Paul says it so well, 2 Corinthians 4, 16, 18, in the message translation, listen to what he says. So we are not giving up. I don't know what you're going through, but we are not giving up. How could we, he says. Even though on the outside, it often looks like things are falling apart on the inside, though. Where God is making new life on the inside, where God is making new life, not a day goes by without his unfolding grace. Hear that. These hard times are small potatoes. I don't know what kind of potatoes they were, but they small potatoes compared to the coming good times, the lavish celebration and preparation for you. There's far more here than meets the eye. The things we see now are here today. Your marriage, your ministry, your money. They're here today. but gone tomorrow. But the things we can't see now will last forever. Jim Elliott, a famous Christian martyr, says, he is no fool to give up what he cannot keep for what he can never lose. He is no fool to give up what he cannot keep for what he can never lose. Family, I want you to hear this. Jesus is absolutely worth being your treasure. 
This is the church. Jesus is worth being your treasure. But here's the beauty. Here's, here's when I, I got some fried chicken now, and we're going to add some, some, uh, some, some collard greens and some mac and cheese now. Here's where it gets full. Jesus is worth being your treasure, but there's more. See, sometimes we miss out on the fullness of this statement. We miss out on the fullness because we don't understand it. We're not willing to dig for the treasure in it. Sometimes we approach this statement from an angry perspective. Jesus is worth being your treasure. And all we've said is that we've, we've made this, this monologue about the cost of discipleship, and you've got to work harder and pray harder and do more and live better, and, and you've got to pray longer. If you're not at the church five days a week, you ain't really a Christian. And you've got to get right or get left. I mean, all of these things. And Jesus is not opposed to the cost. Jesus actually, read the Gospels, Jesus, he does not pull punches when it comes to the cost of living this life. He doesn't pull punches. Anything with value has a cost. But I need you to understand this. The real cost of the kingdom wasn't paid by you. This treasure costs something, but you didn't pay it, family. We didn't pay it. We also, the reason why we miss the fullness, and I'm getting there, we're we're about to land the plane. The reason why we miss the fullness is because we approach this statement nonchalantly. Jesus is worth my treasure. You know, it's, I'm going to heaven, so I'm good. I'm going to heaven so I can live anyway here while I'm on earth. I'm I'm going to heaven so I don't really have to think about this. I'm going to heaven so, you know, I can talk to you any way I want. I can treat you like uh, trash, and I, I can treat you any old way because I'm going to heaven anyway. I'm still, God knows my heart. It's just about me and Jesus I'm at one with the Spirit. I'm at one with Jesus. I've got my chakras and my sage and I, you know my zodiac sign and all those. I... It's about more. I'm just saying there's more to this. The treasure, you didn't pay for it, so it's important for you to figure out why it was loaned to you in the first place. Guilt, family, guilt is never a sustainable motivator. That's why you can get all uh, fired up at a service. Oh, he's stepping on my toes. And then you go home and do the exact same thing that you came to church not to do. Guilt is never a sustainable motivator. But the grace of God, the delight of God, the favor of God, the grace of God gives an unimaginable hope, unimaginable strength. The grace of God is what changes lives. It's the kindness of God that leads men to repentance. So here's the fullness. Here's the fullness. Here's what I want you to get. See, see, the disciples, they were in this house. We're back in the house now. And the disciples, no matter what was said, it, it can sometimes be easy to forget what Jesus did for the crowd. But it's difficult to forget what Jesus does for you. I can forget what he, oh, he healed, oh, Brother Island is able to walk and he's able to do this. But it's difficult to forget what he did for me. Can you imagine being in this house? You know who else probably would have been there? That woman with the issue of blood that she struggled with for 12 years, and she's in the midst of a crowd, and she grabs on to the, the coattail of Jesus' garment, and he says, who touched me in the middle of a crowd? He says, woman, your, your faith has healed you. She was restored. She was renewed. Something changed in her. She was in that house, I bet. But also when Jesus is in this journey, he meets this guy named Jairus, and Jairus is on his feet. He's at the feet of Jesus on his knees. He's an official. He shouldn't be doing this. He's pleading with Jesus to say, heal my daughter. And Jesus goes and heals the daughter of Jairus, I bet. He says, Talitha Kum, little girl, my child, my daughter, get up. I guarantee that she was in there getting up in the house. Can you imagine Peter, James, and John, who he had saved from being fishermen? This was a mundane existence for them. And he says, I'm calling you into more. I bet they were at that house. Family, here's what I'm trying to get you to see. We've talked about the treasure of the kingdom. And and, and we should talk more about the treasure of the kingdom. But we have to understand what the king treasures. What does the king treasure? Sometimes that's lost on us. We, We are so focused on getting to the cost of discipleship and shaking people up that we miss what the king treasures. The king treasures his people. He delights in those who fear him and those who hope in his steadfast love. The king treasures the people. What this means is that Jesus is worth being your treasure because he treasures you. 
That's the fullness of it. That he made the first move. He took initiative. I don't have to figure this thing out. It's the grace of God that actually found me. The hound dog of heaven chased me down. Yeah. Yeah. He found me. Not because I'm special, not because I'm, I'm good, not because I can do this or that, but just because he said so. You are the treasure to the king. I need you to understand this, that Jesus, this what he's talking about, he didn't just step down from heaven just to, to, feel, uh, to do some theological continuity. Oh, yeah, I'm fulfilling all the prophecies. That was good. But he stepped down from heaven for you. Let that sink in. He stepped down from heaven for you. He put on human clothes for you. He got whipped, beaten, stoned, and put on a cross for you. And here's what he does. This is what I love about Jesus. He looks at your sin-filled life and he says, that's my treasure, Tim. He, he, he looks at your self-righteous attitude and he says, you're my treasure, James. He looks at us, our, our lying and our conniving and our manipulation and all of our challenges, and he says, you're my treasure. He looks at your failure of your past, how you didn't choose your spouse the first time the right way, and now he says, you're still my treasure. He looks at you who, who are walking in divorce. He looks at the divorce season and says, you are my treasure. He looks at the widower and says, you are my treasure. He looks at the orphans and says, you are my treasure. He looks at the liars. He looks at the stealers. He looks at the murderers. He looks at the pedophiles. And he says, you are my treasure. <laughs> Family, I, I don't know what else you need to hear, but you are his treasure. Let that sink in. You are his treasure. I want to invite the band up, and we're going to land the plane. Invite the man up. Here we go. Let's take it back to the house. The disciples are in this tension. <laughs> Sitting with Jesus, he's talking about the kingdom of heaven is like, and you're like, what is going on here? But read this now with a different eye. Read this now with, with, with fullness. Here it is. The kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field. The kingdom of heaven. The beauty of the kingdom is hidden in a field. Think about this. You are his treasure. Hidden in a field. The field is the world. You were hidden in the world. Your treasure was hidden in the world. For God so loved the world. You were hidden in the world. Here's what he says. When a man found it, when Jesus found it, when Jesus saw you before you even were in your mother's womb, he knew you, he saw you, he chose you, he planned for you. And he says he hid it again. In other words, he stepped down into human clothes. He stepped down in human likeness so he could live among us, to dwell among us. And then it says, in his joy, went and sold all he had to, and bought the field. In other words, Hebrews tells us, Jesus is the author and finisher of our faith. And so we look to him because he endured the cross. He joyfully, he says, he joyfully endured the cross for the joy that was ahead of him, for the joy set before him. He endured the cross, despising its shame. And now he sits on the throne. He sits seated with God in heaven. Family, I need you to hear this. I'm almost done, I promise. Saving your life was a joy for him. Dying so that you could live was a joy for him. <laughs> Giving you life was a joy for him. Comforting you is a joy for him. Creating you was a joy for him. Your life has meaning. Your life has purpose. You've got to understand your life is a treasure. You are his treasure. I don't care what the world says. I don't care what your husband says. I don't care what your wife says. I don't care what your kids say. I don't care what their boyfriend says, the girlfriend says. I don't care what your job says. You are his treasure. You're worth it. You're valuable. You're highly esteemed. You're cherished. He delights in you. It doesn't matter what your situation is. It doesn't matter what you've been through. It doesn't matter how hard it was. He delights in you. He treasures you and family in the stretch. While you're stretching, while he's pulling, you have to remember that because he's stretching you, he still wants to use you. He invites us to focus on the treasure because it's there we find hope. Hope in the hidden place is that Jesus is worth being our treasure because he treasures you. 
Would you stay on your feet as we get ready to pray together? What do we do with this? <laughs> Here's the part where it's like, well, what, what does that mean? What do we do with this? Here it is. Explore the treasure. I want to invite some of our prayer partners up just for a moment, if we can take a moment to reflect and think through what God is doing in our own hearts, in our own life, because I believe God wants to be personal right now. Explore the treasure. Here it is. At the end of this text, Jesus says that there's a man who bought a field. There's a man who actually saw a treasure. He stumbled upon a treasure. He hid it. He, he found When he found a treasure, he goes and he sells everything to go buy the field. What the question that I had is, why didn't Jesus just buy the treasure? The question I was really wrestling with was, why didn't Jesus just buy the piece of, of, of land that was around the treasure? It said he bought the whole field. Why did he buy the whole field? Because maybe there's more to the treasure than we thought. Maybe there's more treasure than we thought. What does that mean? That means that there's more treasure in you. That means that you, you, he is still stretching you. You've got more to you. But that, it also means, <laughs> here's the hard part. Maybe, maybe, just maybe, you weren't the only treasure in the field. Maybe life is bigger than you. Maybe the key to some of our issues is when we connect with other treasures in the field. Maybe the key is when we submit our lives to the owner of the field and relate to some of the other treasures. Some of you are walking through things right now that you would be able to get over them a lot quicker if you would just reach out, if you would just connect with others, if you would just spend some time and allow someone to pray with you. And I want to give you that opportunity right now. Whether you're watching online or you're standing here in this building, we've got some prayer partners here. There are pastors around. There's all these other folks who want to pray with you, who want to show you and want to allow you to see the treasure that we have. The treasure of the kingdom, but the treasure in community, the treasure of each other. So whatever it is, right now, I want you to take a moment. If you've got to pray, do that. If you've got to scream, do that. If you need to shout, you can do that. If you want to sit down and, and reflect, you, well, do it. <laughs> Allow Jesus to meet you. I, I really hope that this goes from your head, gets, God, gets out of your neck. Like You shouldn't feel all the pain in your neck. Let it get into your heart. Let's pray. Father, do what you will. Have your way. We don't have to stir. We don't have to prod. <laughs> You're God. You are the one who shifts things. You are the one who changes things. You are the one who is mending the broken relationship. You are the one who is allowing husband and wife to stand next to each other right now. We know they came here with issues, but you're the one who will allow them to experience healing as they leave. You are the one who meets the needs of the broken. You're the one who meets the orphan. You're the one who meets the widower. Lord, you are the one who walks with those who are grieving right now. You are the one that we put our hope in. Lord, we need your hope right now. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.